such a warm welcome to you all for being here this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're coming in from. Welcome. This is, of course, an hour with the amazing Danielle Soret, who is the author of Until We Reckon. And of course, the core theme today we're going to explore is that it's been five years since she brought forth that amazing book. And we'll be looking very closely at her at the origins of it, um, the core themes of it, as well as her reflections on five years in. And this is, of course, Restorative Justice on the Rise, hosted. And we've been in motion for 13 years now, offering public live forums, panels, advocacy events online and in person. It's an honor and a pleasure to work alongside and with you in this field. And certainly today, very much looking forward to being here with everyone. Um, I want to take a moment before honoring, of course, our very special guest um, to say thank you to uh, our intern, Paulina Phelps, who is with us here today. And you can see her lovely face on the screen. Paulina has worked with us over the years to support our project. And um, it's just an honor and a delight to have Paulina as well as uh, our mentor, Mary Mull from the Eastern Mennonite University Master's Program here with us today. Uh, it's very important that we encourage each other in this field. And um, thank you so much, Paulina, for everything that you have done in restorative justice work. I know that you worked a lot with uh, Professor David Karp and um, it's just great to have you here with us. So again, uh, just a few protocols, if I may ask, for those who are with us and joining us, if you would turn off camera just for a moment, we're going to open up with a brief reading from Until We Reckon. And I know that most of us are very familiar with who Danielle is, but I would encourage you to go to commonjustice.org if you have not already. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing many of you are very familiar with Common Justice. And um, of course, that's the organization that Danielle founded and what an extraordinary uh, organization and it, that holds a very important place in this field. We're looking forward to hearing more from Danielle about that today. I was at the 2019 National Association for Community and Restorative Justice Conference where we honored Danielle with the award uh, for Until We Reckon. And I was saying to Danielle a moment ago, that I feel remiss that we haven't had this uh, opportunity to speak with her um, for this long. So Danielle, thank you so much for being here today and a warm welcome. And if we may um, just start out with a very, I think, profound statement that you make in the introduction of Until We Reckon. And then um, we'll move into a little dialogue between you and I and then open up for questions from our beautiful people um, attending live here today. So I'd like to start out, if I may, um, just by offering this, this uh, quote from the introduction of Until We Reckon. Daniel says, sometimes I think of America not as a place or a nation, but a promise. It is the only way I can continue to love this country. The notions of equality and liberty that are meant to define us and bind us can only truly be ours if we understand them as a destination to which we are relentlessly headed, not a station we have already reached. I think James Baldwin was right, as he usually was, when he wrote, American history is longer larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. This may par be particularly true of the history of our national relationship to violence, but despite the persistence of violence as a defining feature of our culture, I continue to believe we can become a country that makes violence our shared enemy and begins the work of eradicating it. I continue to believe in our chances of finding and choosing the road from the America we are to the America we still have a chance of becoming. 
I believe our chances of doing so will depend on our ability to look squarely and honestly at what we have done and what we are doing and to choose to do something different instead. This book aims to be an imperfect, useful tool in our shared work to do just that. So Danielle Sareb, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're extremely- Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for being here with us for this conversation. So Dan Danielle, I'm I'm curious if, if you would like to start out um, possibly today with just naming perhaps global practices, teachers, or um, traditions that you feel are deeply rooted within you, you know, to, to look back before we look a little bit forward here with our conversation today. What ins who and what has inspired you? I mean, I feel I could take the whole hour on this question and it might be a better use than whatever else we're gonna do, but I'll, I'll try to be brief since we promised something else. Um, you know, so I have so many teachers in this work. Some of my earliest teachers narrowly kind of in restorative justice include Cheryl Graves out of Chicago, who is um, an extraordinary practitioner and also an extraordinary human. And I think helps all of us learn that no amount of mastery of philosophy or craft or tactics or practice is sufficient if our whole hearts aren't sort of in it and constantly in like a posture of transformation. Um, Tanya Davis out of Oakland, who um, is a teacher of many of ours and sort of came out of fighting a war in the criminal legal system and into a work of healing deeply rooted in indigenous practices and indigenous practices globally, including on the African continent and really understanding how to reach back in a way that's like authentic um, and not sort of just about putting on pretense and making acknowledgements to lineages that aren't our own, but um, honoring the lineages that exist and excavating the ones that are ours. Um, there are people, you know, like Miriam Kaba, who I've learned from since before that was cool. Um, and I, I think about Miriam as an abolitionist and a practitioner of this kind of work and that the thing, she says so many things, she teaches us so many things. And I think in some ways her deepest teaching is about that, you know, everything good, everything worthwhile we do, we do with other people. Um, and she's a deeply relational person. She's a deeply kind person. And there's a way I think like love gets a rap for being soft, but love is actually one of the hardest and most demanding practices we ever engage in. And to do love well and consistently and broadly requires, I think, more of us as people than almost anything else. And I think Miriam embodies that um, all the time. Uh, Mimi Kim is someone who I've learned from forever and met more recently and could like barely speak when I finally met her. Um, but her work at Creative Interventions, um, that just has been helping us imagine things we could do other than the criminal legal system, other than punishment, um, in a way centered on survivors for decades and decades and decades has been a beacon. And then there are all sorts of people whose names you won't know, like people who kind of grew me up in Chicago where I was born and raised, who where, you know, I understood mutual aid as someone, as you do with mutual aid, as someone who gave it and received it, right? Who I understood um, things about the criminal legal system as, as a beneficiary of its inequity. I understood things about its failures as a survivor of violence and someone who caused harm. Um, and I saw people in Chicago make peace in ways that should have been impossible. And those were moments of, of inspiration and of bright light and of hope in a time that was otherwise, um, you know, overcome with loss. And so those are some of them. And then there are a million more. Um, and each of our participants has taught me, like we joke our curriculum, each lesson could be named after the participant that we learned with to create that part of it. And all the people who work at Common Justice co-create it every day and make it better than I ever would have alone. Like, God forbid, Common Justice looks like what I would have done alone. Like, that's one of my greatest nightmares. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think in some ways the things we learn in restorative justice that we learn in abolitions, like we learn 
a, a practice of continuous learning. Um, I have a kid who is a month younger than my book. Um, and he often, when I tell him things, he'll say, how do you know? And at first that sounds, normally we say, how do you know? It means like if a teenager says that they're challenging you, they basically mean, I don't believe you, but he doesn't. And at first when he said that, I was like, ew, rude. Um, but that's not what he means. He means, how do you know? Right. And he means that because he's, he's so curious about how one learns things. Like, where do you learn if whales have eyelids, as one of our recent questions, if raspberries breathe, who thought of police in the first place, right? Like, what were we, like, who took care of the very first baby, which means you then have to explain evolution, you know, like, all these things, like, he wants to know, like, how do you come to know these things? And I think, He's helped me deepen my citation practice, you know, that I learn, especially from some of like my black feminist teachers. But I think um, so much of this work requires like a posture of continuous curiosity, which is why um, I'm going to stop now because otherwise I will really take the full hour on this. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Danielle. Just a sincere and deep bow to you for being willing to bring forward until we reckon and everything that comes with it. And I want to also take a, a moment to honor everyone that's in the room with us, each of you, your dedication to creating a world that I, my friend and colleague, Charles Eisenstein calls uh, the world that our hearts know is possible and that we're actualizing, we are, we're doing this. And to come back to that beautiful introduction quote, um, that that this is a, a world that we're creating together. Um, so um, I just, I, I'm curious if you might share with us a bit about the any moments where you were at in the, the birth of Until We Reckon, since the conversation is about, you know, of course the context linearly that it's been five years in the world now, um, so let's go back for a moment, though, and would you share with us what inspired the book and what what did you really, you know, wrestle with a bit or, um, you know, were there obstacles and challenges that you faced in bringing this forward? Um, I, the origin story is sort of not as, is more and less beautiful than one would hope. I was tricked into writing it by the extraordinary Diane Wachtel at the New Press. And the New Press is, they published The New Jim Crow. It's the book they're most known for, but they published a ton of really other extraordinary work. One of the biggest, most robust publishers on criminal justice. And one of the things they do that distinguishes them is they publish a lot of people whose work isn't mostly publishing books, you know, who aren't academics or authors, like people who are doing stuff and they help them write books about the stuff they're doing. And so they have a really incredible practice of working with people who've never written a book before. And so Diane reached out to me and sort of persuaded me that writing a book wouldn't be too much work. I was teaching a class at the time and she persuaded me that if I recorded that class and got it transcribed, which they would pay to do, that I would basically have several chapters and then I just kind of have to fill it in. And I did that. And I think that got me like 20 pages. Like it was a farce, but by then I'd committed to the project. I'd sign a contract. I'm a promise keeper, like by nature and blood. So that means like, if I make a promise, it's I'm stuck with it forever. Like once I give my word, I'm from Chicago. So like once my word is my bond, once I give my word, it's over, there's no way out. Um, and so I, I feel in some ways I was tricked into it and it's probably for the best. Cause I think, um, I think all but like the most arrogant of us have like a ton of questions, like why me? Should I write it? What do I have to say that's of use? You know, like, um, all of those things, like, what if it's embarrassing? What if I say stupid things and it's written forever? You know, it's documented permanently that I didn't know or understand something well. Like, that's the part of the book that was scariest to write by far, like, without exception was the acknowledgements. Um, because the rest of it, I'm sort of like, of course I'm learning. Like, hopefully I do know something better now than I did in 2019. And of course I missed something. And of course I'll write it and like be corrected in something before it even hits the presses. You know, like that's just the nature of it. 
But the acknowledgments was like the notion that I would leave someone out whose name I should have included, like kept me up at night. Like it was the piece I was most nervous about. Anyone who writes books, start working on that at the beginning, like before you have a title. Um, Cause that's the, that's the only part of the book that was only mine. Like everything else is co-written, co-owned, co-created, right? Like it's knowledge that belongs to all of us. I'm like the note taker in many respects. Um, but the acknowledgements chapter was really just for me. And so I felt an enormous amount of pressure around writing that. Um, and I wanted it, like, I just wanted it to be useful. Like I didn't want it, to, I wasn't trying to write a bestseller. Um, I wasn't trying to write a book that everybody would like. I wasn't trying to like get on Oprah. Um, I was trying to write something that would be useful. Um, and I thought of it like a step stool rather than a Picasso, right? Like, and I live in New York City. So in New York City, for those of you who aren't here, the most, unless you're terribly rich, you live in a small place. And that means in like the high, you have to put things you use regularly in cabinets too high for you to reach. It's just like the only way you can live. And so step stools are really important. Like step stools aren't just like, oh, that's where I go when I go down memory lane to find the box of things from when I was a kid. No, like you need step stools to get shit from the top shelves of your kitchen. And they matter. And so it's like, I wanted to make a step stool. I wanted to make something that was sturdy enough to bear someone's weight and that people might be able to stand on and reach the things they needed that might bring us a little closer to, to what we could become. Um, I don't have any illusion that common justice is perfect. It's not perfect in my view. And that's, and of course, and then I have my own blind spots, right? It's that hopefully it's useful, right? Like hopefully it is values driven and we move with enough integrity and we do our work well enough that it creates a basis for something that comes. And I think that was the same hope I had for the book. Mm, beautiful. And my humble opinion and view is that you brought forward something that is a bridge to bring people into mm. the practices and you're offering mm. the practices and the solutions as well from what I can tell. Mm. And um, one of those is featured on the landing page at commonjustice.org. For those of you just joining us, welcome. Um, we're talking of course with Danielle Sered and the landing page features a, vi a victim's um, compensation video that's really powerful. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering, would you spontaneously be willing to speak a little bit about that? It's a three minute video and I, I would show it, but I wanna get into our a conversation with everyone here too, as well. So would would you be willing to share a bit about that that current effort and um, anything sure. you have to say? Because because really the book brought forward those values that um, and maybe you could framework those for us a bit more clearly. There's four areas mm -hmm. and how those land at Common Justice Center brought forward. Sure, and um, so I'm happy to talk about the campaign, um, our policy organizing and communication teams just won the Fair Access to Victims Compensation Campaign with a ton of partners. Um, the governor signed it reluctantly into law in December after a two-year fight, which for New York is very fast. Um, and the bill relates to victims' compensation. There's federal money that is dispersed to the states and Victims of crime can access it for things like emergency medical treatment, physical therapy from injuries arising from the event, trauma-focused therapy, expen relocation expenses, those sorts of things. Um, but the, in almost every state, um, because of how the states interpret the federal law, those resources are only available to people who report to the police. And we know that more than half of victims of violence don't report to the police. And that group disproportionately includes black and brown survivors who fear for their safety, um, people who are afraid of retaliation, immigrant survivors who are afraid of ISIS involvement, survivors of intimate partner violence who live with the people they would be reporting on, LGBTQIA survivors who are afraid of calling the police, people on probation and parole who worry that they'll be violated because they're believed to have been engaged in something they shouldn't have by virtue of being hurt. Like all of our most marginalized survivors become excluded from these resources. And so it means they can't go to trauma-focused healing and they don't follow up with physical therapy and they can't relocate. And all those things are incredibly important to healing, to breaking cycles of violence. All of us deserve them. 
And they're often also still saddled with lifelong medical debt for the emergency room visit that they couldn't elect or opt out of because it just happened after. And so the bill removes the requirement that people call the police and instead can report to victim service providers and access these resources that already exist. And I described it sort of as law enforcement and healing getting a long overdue divorce. Like it's one of those couples where you're like, I don't know what they saw each other in the first place. That dynamic always gave me bad vibes. There was clearly some power and control at play. Like they didn't belong together. Um, and in a certain way, it's like, you know, it's a it's a bill that's about the distribution of these resources. Um, I think of it in many respects as a very deeply abolitionist bill in the sense that abolition isn't just about and getting rid of prisons, right? And abolition is about extracting conflict from punishment, extracting healing from punishment, right? Like separating out these things that actually don't belong to one another, but where it's like the bouncer at the, there's a room filled with healing and there's a armed bouncer at the door that only some of us can get past, right? It's about the separation of the elements of like human relation and human existence that have been like forced into relationship with the criminal legal system and in separating them from that, those things can thrive, right? It's like weeding a garden. Um, and so the bills export, we think of it as a gender justice issue, a racial justice issue, an economic justice issue. The team that won it is extraordinary um, and they're coming for more. Um, and then you asked about the four pillars. Our grounding pillars um, speak to solutions to violence and believe we believe that solutions to violence should be survivor-centered, accountability-based, safety-driven, and racially equitable. Those things sound straightforward and even sound in some respects like what we say we do, but the reality is we do almost none of that. We do things in the name of survivors, but don't ask for them, ask them what they actually want. We say we do accountability, but really we do punishment. Um, we say we're safety-driven, but actually, Everything we do in the criminal legal system runs contrary to overwhelming evidence about what works. Um, and we pretend to be aspiring to be racially equitable, but we never have been. Like that's a fundamentally aspirational um, position for our nation, given what we've been and what we've chosen so far. And as you say, I believe in the book that we, if we were really doing what we are saying that we're doing within these frameworks, um, we would be the most successful nation in the world. But on the contrary, we're on the other end of that with the incarceration of, I mean, we all know the statistics. That's of right. Yeah, and I mean, we would be the safest nation in all of human history, but, and yeah. so I mean that, it means the black and brown neighborhoods where these practices have been most concentrated would be like Edenic havens where no yeah. one ever got hurt. Like it is just not what these methods produce. It never has been. And that's, we have run this experiment for centuries and the evidence is overwhelmingly consistently clear in all instances. How, if we're gonna, in just a moment, we, we really wanna um, start opening up to our actually quite global audience. Thank you to those of you from Vietnam, from India, from Canada, um, North American continent uh, at large, as well as I believe Mexico. Uh, those of you from other countries in the world, um, equally and warmly welcome today. Please uh, prepare to ask questions if you would like, and if you would be mindful of the time that we still have together today. We're only here for a very short hour, and really wanting to honor voice choice, too, that if you wish to keep your camera off, that's of course fine, and if you'd like me to ask your question for you. And I would just ask, please, if we could focus on um, the work and the, the, the efforts at hand, um, that's kind of the core topic today. So anything related um, to that would be very warmly welcome as a live question. And it looks like Kendall is ready to ask. Um, so I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and defer to you, Kendall, so that you can come in with us and then we'll come back uh, to what I had in mind in a moment. And a warm yeah. welcome to those of you that are also just joining us. Of course, we're talking with Danielle Sered, of Common Justice and of Until We Reckon, a, a very extraordinary book. And I, I believe many in our uh, community today have already read it. Uh, and I hope that if you have not, that you will, and you'll spread the word about this work and the book and commonjustice.org. 
Kendall, welcome. It's great to see you here today. Can I, should I come off a cam on camera while I ask the question and then That's come up out? That's up to or you. Just, okay, I'll, yep. all right. Well, it's not going off on camera. So um, yes, Danielle, it's wonderful to be able to uh, hear you speak again. And thank you for your book. Uh, we've given it to judges, to district attorneys here in Minnesota. And very excited with all that's happening in Minnesota and, and the way that common justice has been a part of it. But how confident are you that we here now with our new Office of Restorative Practices can move our vision beyond youth, relatively minor crimes to violence reduction on the scale that you envisioned and until we reckon in uh, what you're doing now at Common Justice? So thank you so much for the question. Um, I will say that my confidence has nothing to do with the State Office of Restorative Practices, right? Um, I think there's really mixed views. It's so complicated for a set of practices that belong out of the state that are specifically about centering harm between people and not a violation of the state to be housed by the state. It's messy and then the state has money and power and we want access to the money and power. Those questions are really complex. And so I'll say like the fact of the existence of that office in itself means very little, I think to my optimism. Um, the things that do make me op very optimistic about Minnesota um, are the underlying organizing that is what led to the creation of that office, right? Like what is happening between and among people that generated sufficient power of which that office is like partial but not total evidence. Um, I'm enormously, we've been actually, Common Justice has been spending time in Minnesota. Um, it's one of the places we're working closely now and have been deeply moved by the people we've come to know there. And I have enormous confidence in what they can do collectively, like very specifically in ways, you know, I have confidence in humans generally, but I have confidence in these specific humans um, in Minneapolis in particular um, and what I think they can bring forth collectively and what we're ready to do. Um, the thing I will say is that, um, my optimism there and everywhere um, is probably like differently rooted than it was at the beginning. Like when I first started doing this work, I think when I started doing this work, I was optimistic because I believed, I knew these things worked. Um, that's still part of the basis for my optimism. And I sort of knew we could persuade people of how good they were. And I think what I've learned over time is that, um, Persuasion is a fine, but pretty, um, pretty, not useless, but pretty inadequate tool. Um, I remember many years ago, my colleague and friend and mentor, Lorenzo Jones, said to me, um, you don't win because you're right, you win because you're strong. And at the time, it was really bad news because we were right, but not strong. <laughs> um, and so I didn't love that information when I learned it. But essentially what it means is that... Um, we'll win when we build power, right? Like we've always been right. Like all of the evidence shows incarceration is criminogenic, meaning people who go into prisons are likelier to commit more and more serious crimes than people who don't. That's been true. It's been proven countless times. If the evidence mattered, we would win the day over and over and over again. The evidence for community violence intervention so vastly exceeds the impact of policing, always has, you know, and so, being right is insufficient. Um, and the thing that works is strength. Then you can build strength with um, institutional power, you can build it with lots of money, or you build it with lots of people. Um, and as people organize, um, as people collectively come together to insist that we deserve something different and better than the status quo, I think there's very little we can't win. And I think the fundamental efficacy of restorative justice gives us an extraordinary basis for that organizing. And so the thing that makes me most optimistic about Minneapolis and about other places um, is when organizing is present, like when people are building power to insist on collectively being able to define what will happen when we're hurt, like what we want when we're harmed, what we want when people we love hurt others, like how we are going to behave as a society. And that when I think about organizing, I, I feel certain that we'll win.
Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much, Kendall, for your question and warmly welcoming other questions in a way that works for you. And wanting to honor the pre-submitted questions, there were some, a couple that were, um, seem like core questions for more than one person in our RSVP process. And one of those was a simple question about shortening sentences. And I wondered if you might have some thoughts on that on behalf of the rest of us here today together. And yeah, this, our sentences in this country are, um, they're, they're inhumane and they're senseless. And I say that like partly, like people will, human beings will be sentenced to things like 160 years. Like that's not a number of years humans live, right? And so there is something where we like really, are, we are so fundamentally separated from the fact of a human's life <laughs> and a human's lifespan. Like none of that is present in how we think about sentencing. I think um, there are a couple of things I think are important for shortening sentences. Um, you know, one is, you know, we have to run really good campaigns. We have to organize, we have to do all of those things like sort of related to what I said above. Um, one is we have to really target not just the maximums but the minimums. I think people often ask me what legislation would most help the expansion of restorative justice. And I always answer the elimination of mandatory minimums. Um, mandatory minimums concentrate power exclusively in prosecutors. And while judges aren't always better, they can be, right? Like they are supposed to be impartial, at least even if many of them have come up through prosecution, it doesn't mean they still hold those duties entirely. Um, and because when a mandatory minimum is in place, it means unless the district attorney will dismiss the charges, the judges cannot sentence anyone to less than the minimum allowed in the law. They don't have the discretion. If the minimum is five to 10 years, they don't have discretion to say somebody can go to an alternative to incarceration program. And so any interventions that aim to serve as alternatives become entirely dependent on the cooperation of the district attorney. And in some jurisdictions, they, you know, people have elected district attorneys who are more amenable, but in most it's in most jurisdictions, they haven't. Um, and so the elimination of mandatory minimums is incredibly important. But I think the other thing I think about a lot with shortening sentences is not as obvious, which is that I think it's incredibly important that we develop a much more robust body of alternatives to incarceration for serious offenses like common justice. And my experience talking, you know, to hundreds of survivors over the years, um, and as a survivor myself, is that it's actually strangely easier to persuade a survivor, at least, which we know survivors have no legal standing in the criminal legal system, but still it matters. It's more, it's more compelling to persuade a survivor. A survivor is more interested in an alternative than in a shorter sentence. Um, so I can think of one of our people early on, one of our harm parties who reached out to asked me, he was like, can he get, it was an armed robbery. He said, can he get life without parole? I said, no, the New York statute doesn't allow for it for this charge. And he said, okay, well, let's do common justice. And from a criminal legal perspective, that's crazy. Like, why would he go from wanting life without parole to zero years, right? Like, wouldn't he want the stopover at 15 years, which is what was being offered. And from his perspective, he wants that per his, ideally, he would never see that person again. That person would never be free again. He'd never deal with them again. But if that's not an option, he wants that person to be changed. And he has a realistic assessment of how and how well that person will be changed by the criminal legal system. Um, and so if that person is going to return to his or other neighborhoods, he wants the person to be better than he believes they'll be if they're incarcerated. And so he'd sooner see someone in common justice. It's a deeply pragmatic decision. And I think a lot about something one of my mentors taught me growing up in Chicago, which was that it's hard to get people to fight for a shit sandwich easy on the shit. Um, and I think very often we do that, right? We want 10 years instead of 20 years. We want life without parole to have the death penalty. All of those fights I think are sacred. I think every day of human freedom is sacred and each of those fights matter. But they're hard to animate a collective around. Um, and instead I find that just like for our harm parties, they prefer an alternative to like when the DA says we, you know, we could get 10 years, but we only want five on your case. Survivors feel devalued. They feel like they're saying their case isn't worth as much as the, the, the love language of the criminal legal of the prosecutor's office is a high sentence. Like that's how they convey value. That's their currency. Um, 
Where So when you say my currency is sentencing and I'm giving you half, people feel devalued, people fight for their worthiness of the whole. Whereas when you offer something else like common justice, you're offering the whole. Like I always say, if you ask a survivor their order, they'd be like, I'd like an extra large, what do you have? <laughs> right? Because we want, our pain is the most, We are the healing we need is the most, we want the most of whatever it is. And so in fact, offering less of, of a bad thing, like a shit sandwich light on the shit, is, you know, if I'm going to eat that sandwich, I want as little on it as possible, like to be real. But like, what if we thought about, like, what if we fought for at least peanut butter and jellies? What if we dared imagine in our fight, fighting for a nutritious meal with enough that people could bring leftovers home to their loved ones who couldn't come to the table, right? Like, what if we actually put forward an affirmative vision for the things we do want and we fought for those instead? And I think when those fights are present, I think they actually do spill over into the fights about sentencing. They spill over into the culture of sentencing in individual courtrooms, um, but they also pave our way to being able to fight for, for numbers like zero years accompanied with a meaningful intervention. And I think that part of our practice is incredibly important. Mm. You demonstrate humanizing the justice system as it pertains very specifically to survivors of harm and survivors of harm needs. I love that about your work. It's very important. And as a practitioner, facilitator, keeper myself, a uh, former program director of a restorative justice program working alongside uh, courts and with communities, um, one of the questions that also was repetitively asked in our RSVP with our community here today was specific to how do we link this very definitive evidence of humanizing and giving power back to our survivors and also to the process of doing sorry, as you say it, you know, how, uh, and accountability, authentic accountability, not just the word accountability, but that we are, we are creating a space for there to be a real depth of, of what we might call authentic justice here. Um, so would you be willing to speak to how you work with people that might be skeptics in different community pockets, professionals, you know, judges, DAs, um, you know, citizens, uh, survivors themselves who may be feeling reticent about how this might work? And we'll get we'll get to more of the questions in just a moment. But sure. I think there's some commonalities in those conversations and there are some real differences. Like a survivor's stake in the outcome and a DA's stake in the outcome are fundamentally different. We've sort of been taught to believe that those things are similar, but they are fundamentally different. And so I'll say first with survivors, what we do, 90% of survivors offered common justice to choose it like 90%. And the way we get to that number is we tell people, we affirm that what happened to them is wrong. We ask them what they want to see come out of it, out of all of this. We ask them of those things they want, which they think they'll get in their own view, if the person's incarcerated, and of those things they want, which they think they'll get in their own view, if the person is in common justice. And they choose common justice largely out of self-interest, right? Like we don't ask for their mercy. We don't ask them to lay down anger. We don't ask them to like believe and hope for change in another human being. Those things sometimes come later, they usually do. But on the front end, we ask them to be pragmatic. We ask them to think about what makes sense for them. And we give them agency to do that. Um, I think we find with survivors as like more broadly in community that there are very few community members who would not support the availability of an option like this to a survivor who wanted it. They might think they might not think they would choose it themselves. They might not choose it themselves, but very few people would want to foreclose the option. To, if you said, do you want survivors of serious violence to have an option to access restorative justice if that's what they want? Almost everyone will tell you yes. Um, with prosecutors and judges and such, I think the the conversation is much, it's again, it's very pragmatic. You know, we've had fewer than 7% of our participants terminated for new crimes. 
In a 10-year analysis of our graduates, only one had been reconvicted of a violent felony offense, and that was a weapons possession, not even a use, which is characterized as a violent felony in New York. Um, so the results are really compelling. They are compelled by the fact that survivors in our in the way we do our work, survivors have veto power. People only get into the program if the survivors consent. I think they're compelled by that morally and that it provides political cover. I think both are true at the same time. Um, and and I think some met some people in the criminal legal system have went there to try and do justice and are sort of sitting around looking at their crappy tools all day. You know, like they've seen, I remember when District Attorney Gonzalez in Brooklyn said, this was before he was a DA, he said, I remember the first time I looked at a 50 page rap sheet and read it as a story of our failure instead of the person's, right? Like understanding they win, they lock people up and those people just come back and do it again. They, survivors are disappointed and angry with them all the time. Like the people who they feel like they're serving don't feel served by it. They see things not working. And so some of them don't, some of them don't see the failure. Some of them protect themselves from seeing the failure so they can keep working every day. But I think some of them do and um, and they benefit from having options that work as well. And then it's also, it's about building power. Like it also is about making sure you are building sufficient power that it is in their self-interest to do it. Um, not just in their heart, not just in their opinion, but that it is also has to be in their self-interest. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. And inviting anyone who would wish to ask questions to continue to do so in the chat, or you can also voice in uh, on camera, off camera, as you wish. And would love to honor a couple questions that are coming in here in the chat. Uh, the first one, I think you've already touched on a bit, but if you have any further um, thoughts on it, please let's go for it. Kathy asks, do you think restorative justice can work within the criminal legal system? And I like that. No. Question. Yeah, no. Oh. No. It's restorative justice is about the harm, the people who commit harm and the people who are harmed and those impacted coming together, reach an agreement about how to make things as right as possible. The criminal legal system is none of those people. Um, none of the in actors in it are any of those people. Um, we work adjacent to that system. We work adjacent to it because it's where people are. Um, not because we think it's where re restorative justice work is most righteously or most effectively or best situated, but it's, it's like the way EMTs will do a tracheotomy on the sidewalk, not because that's a good place to do a tracheotomy, but because that's where someone fell out. Right. And so common justice is specifically situated as a sort of last off ramp, even after indictment, when there is no possibility in the criminal legal system other than the lengthy incarceration of somebody. And we stand between that person and that outcome and we create an off ramp. And our proximity to the criminal legal system ha inevitably has a distorting effect on the work, right? Like it, inevitably the force and threat of that system is present. Right. It can't not be for all parties, for the person who caused harm, the survivor's experience of it is present. Um, our job is to be honest about that, to as much as possible, help our participants move from extrinsic to intrinsic motivation, to being moved by the criminal legal system, to being instead moved by their own desire to make right, their relationships that they want to mend, the future they want to live, the people they want to be. And we don't get there by pretending that our practices are perfectly pure. We get there by being honest about the sort of, it's like you're next to a huge magnet. You have to you have to figure out how to strengthen people to account for the pull, right? And you don't pretend it's not there. Everyone's just sort of smack pulled toward it. And so I remember I've shared the story before, but like several years ago, somebody called me and told me that somebody was talking trash about common justice. Can you imagine? And I said, what did they say? And they said, they said common justice wasn't pure because you're connected to the criminal legal system. And I said, and when did they talk trash? Like of course, the criminal legal, the, it's, if the best way I've been able to describe it 
is if what my child needed to heal was in the middle of a field of shit strewn with glass, I would walk through that field until I was neck deep to get it for him. And if what someone else's child needs to heal is in the middle of that field, I will walk through it neck deep to get it. If that is where the people are, whose freedom we are working for, will go, but it's not clean work. There's a reason I mostly wear black, you know? <laughs> it's like, you don't wear white boots and try and be pure. And I don't know a pure place you can stand in this country. Like we are soaked in blood. And so I do think we can be righteous and I do think we can be in right relationship. And I think we can be honest and I think we can be good, but I don't think we can be pure. I don't think that's available to us. And so mm. I think we've made a decision to situate ourselves there as part of a larger ecosystem, right? Um, not as a sole solution and as an ecosystem that only works if other people are also doing and building restorative justice in community, keeping holding those people who don't call the police in the first place, the people who don't go to grand jury, the people whose cases are dismissed, like all those other off ramps, right? If people are holding that so that, eventually it's that work that puts us out of business, right? Where there just isn't much coming through anymore. And so there's no need for us to stand where we stand. But I think it's really, it's really important that we understand that um, this work is diminished by its proximity to that system. And that doesn't mean that we don't stand there ever. Right. It doesn't because to not stand there means we let people go. Right. It means we give up on the fight for people's freedom and for people's access, you know, survivors access to healing and repair um, that we at Common Justice are unwilling to give up. Um, but it's I think it's incredibly important to be clear that that proximity is by necessity um, more than by like optimal design. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard anyone speak to that gap, the the real gap so authentically and, and articulately mm -hmm. and beautifully. Thank you, Thank really. You. Uh, okay, <laughs> let me gather myself here. Um, Carolina, thank you for your question. And she asks, in addition to discovering that being right is insufficient, what one or two other important things have you learned in the past five years about effective restorative justice? And thank you, Carolina. I mean, God, like, thank God I've learned a lot. You know, like, how sad would it be to not learn? Um, and I haven't read my book. And sometimes I'm now I'm like, maybe I should read it. God knows what's in there. Um, so I think um, not since then, you know, like I... Um, the book came out and then I had a baby and then COVID hit and then George Floyd was killed, you know, within about a year and so much change. Right. Um, so we came through a global pandemic that we're still coming through together. Um, like, as I speak to you now, my partner's lost smell and taste. We're curious about this. Um, you know, like we, there are people living um, differently and more marginally now because of how we've held that pandemic. We saw a global uprising in response to George Floyd's death. And we saw all sorts of institutions try and at least momentarily align themselves with the interest of racial justice, right? And people who individually experience themselves as differently, like awakened to the reality of structural racism in our country. Um, in some ways more important and more lasting than those things is the feeling of collective power and will that arose among people who gathered at that time, like who felt what it was to be part of a larger group of people fighting for something that could actually win. I think that changed all of us. Um, there's been an extraordinary expansion of abolition in public thought. Like Miriam Cabo was in the New York Times. That would not have been a thing, just to be very clear. The New York Times didn't publish the phrase mass incarceration until I think 2008 because they regarded it as too radical. You know, like we've, the culture around this, like the tolerance of even entertaining the idea that a world without prisons is an argument we need to have, you know, like we even need to debate it is is fundamentally different. And so much of that has been driven by younger organizers um, 
who I think, and I think this is part of what we saw in those uprisings, I think with our cities on fire, with like, with our forests on fire, with everything burning, I think many young organizers have come to terms with the inadequacy of the tools that our generations and the generations before have offered to them to fight the things that we face. Um, and in facing down that inadequacy, there's a mix of despair and fury and extraordinary creativity, you know, like that emerge in different sequences and different ratios and different places and different people. Um, and that's been extraordinary to see and watch and to get to like walk with from time to time. Um, we've seen a lot of concrete things, like we've seen community violence intervention work and violence interrupter work get funded at a level we could never have imagined to see it grow immensely across the country to continue to prove its efficacy. We've seen projects that Common Justice looks to as a shining light, like the Freedom Community Center in St. Louis, like the Rafah Institute in Nashville, People's Advocacy Institute in Jackson, Mississippi, um, this emerging body of work in Minneapolis and more like all over. We're starting a practitioner's lab next month with 11 jurisdictions that all represent people on the cusp of really diverting serious violence. And we've seen that emerge with more and more energy, even as there's been a retrenchment um, from the energy and commitments of 2020, which I'll say something about in a second. I think, um, and we've seen nationally, right? We've seen greater polarization servicing. We've seen emboldened white supremacist stuff. We've seen all these things. I think about all the time about this thing Adrian Marie Brown said many years ago where she said, and this is not an exact quote, but it's close, that things are not getting worse, they're getting revealed. And what we need to do is hold each other close and pull back the veil. Um, and keep pulling back the veil. And then I think it was in like early 2021 that she was like, sorry, y'all, actually they are getting worse. <laughs> um, and she's like, but still we hold each other close and pull back the veil. Like the, what we got to do doesn't change, but actually maybe it is getting worse. Um, and I think we've seen this, um, we've seen the impulse to revert back to whatever we think normal is, even though like what normal is for this country is totally not normal. It's, it's a death making culture. It's a fiercely inequitable culture. It's a violent culture. It's an inhumane culture. It runs contrary to everything we know about humans, about how we want to be and live with each other. But we've, but we, it's what we knew. And so we've seen, you know, the 2020 racial justice funding dry up and the topics sort of move on and the status quo has a strong pull. But I also think something like irresistible has opened up and I don't, think the door will close I don't think it's I don't know that it's a door it's like it's a it's a rip it's a tear it's like it it can't be fully closed and I think I mean more and more what I believe is that there's a world order run by rich white American men that's ending and it will end it will end if only because that ethos burns itself alive like it literally like it sets the world on fire the very world where it lives it sets on fire like it can't last and and then the remaining question was whether those of us who want something new survive that you know like whether we survive that ending and I think I take weird solace from the some of what I hear in white supremacist spaces which is a weird thing to say because they um they have such a sense of imminence of the end of that order. Like they talk about, I've heard one, I watched a video of one rally and they were like, tomorrow, like they're talking to a group of people, this Nazi white man, like Nazi, I mean like self-identified Nazi, um, who was like, you know, tomorrow your schools could be run by black people, that by black women or people who aren't even women. Anyone could be man, woman, whatever gender they want to be. Like black people could be in charge of everything. You'll have to answer to this and that. And he's like, and I'm not talking about your children's children. I'm not talking about 10 years from now. I'm talking five years from now. That's the world we're looking at. And I was like, whoa, we are only five years out. Like we got this y'all. Like if we only got to make it five more years, we can do this. And I think there's a way in which our opposition, I consider them our opposition, understand that this is a moment of existential threat to their, the concentration of power. And, and because as white people were taught that our, our identity and our supremacy are the same, 
we experience a threat to our supremacy as, as an extinction threat, right? Unless we like learn our way out of that. And so I think people are fighting against their extinction. And I think if we fight similarly, right? If we understand also the imminence of the world they see where anybody can be anything, where actually things are distributed equally, where power is distributed equally. Um, if we understand the proximity of that and we also fight for it as hard as we would fight, you know, for our own survival, um, I think we'll win. And I think about, um, you know, what people often say, if you want to know what you would have done in times of slavery, if you want to know what you would have done during the Holocaust, look at what you're doing now. Um, I think if we all understand the urgency of this moment, um, if we understand ourselves at like a, a fulcrum, like turning point in history, and we like muster the collective will to act, um, I don't mean I think it's going to be easy and I don't mean that it won't be ugly or that it won't include loss on the way. I think it will be all those things. Um, but I do, I do think it's within reach. I do think we can win. Mm. We are unfortunately just getting started and yet here we are uh, running up against conclusion and there are some amazing questions awaiting in the chat. And I just want to point back to the power of the practitioner's lab that you're offering and that that's another repeating question that I've discovered um, and our team has seen in the RSVP process. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a brief moment to share with us about the practitioner's lab, is it something that's available publicly and when will it be happening again? I think you mentioned it's coming up again and also um, will it be offered on, a, on an ongoing basis somehow? Sure. I just put a link to it. Um, oh, Thank you. And John, I haven't been in a meeting with you for a long time and I missed this whole vibe. Um, <laughs> um, I put the link in the chat. Um, so the Common Justice Practitioners Lab is a cohort based model for jurisdictions where people are working to um, divert serious violence from the criminal legal system and, you know, build models similar to common justice, not identical. And we did a round of applications. We had more than 50 cohorts, apply, you know, 50 pairs apply, people apply in pairs, and 11 of those will be in this first round of the lab. We'll repeat it again next year, we anticipate. Um, I mean, we'll see, unless it turns out to be a terrible idea. We think it's going to be a great idea. Um, <laughs> we'll learn. And then we'll also be starting in the fall, like much more public offerings, like things that are more broadly available that um, support people who are interested in all these dimensions and thinking about how to do good violence intervention work, how to do survivor-centered work, how to do restorative justice work, how to manage proximity to the criminal legal system um, and make decisions about that and navigate it with integrity, like those sorts of things. And so we'll start, um, you know, fall and early in the new year, we'll have um, a lot more like larger scale public offerings um, around those dimensions as well. Beautiful. And that, that to me really matches up with what I mentioned earlier as your work being quite a bridge uh, of both uh, an exploratory of the very edge themes and um, solutions towards the gaps that are practical and real. So thank you for that. And John, I, I love his uh, energy around the linear uh, time frame. I don't think we can go over the clock, Danielle. I know you have a busy day today, but maybe we could have you back. That would be an honor. Um, I think we have time to ask a few more brief and easy questions. And Bettina just chimed in with one that I think is fairly quick in its answer before we have a meaningful yeah. conclusion today. We do not work in the criminal, in the juvenile justice system, but our beloved colleagues at the Restorative Justice Project that was 
until recently at Impact Justice and now is at Equal Justice USA, led by um, my wonderful colleague, Simone Fuller, does do work there, including doing, um, they do technical assistance and training work with um, jurisdictions around the country that are working in that system. So they're an amazing resource for that. And, and thank you, Bettina. Thank you so much. Craig asks, I think, in my humble opinion, again, a very important question, and it probably we don't have time to really go into it deeply, but the trauma healing aspect is a big thing right now, especially pertinent to restorative justice. We hear trauma-informed practices and restorative justice, and do we really know what that means and how we put that into practice? And do you have a quick thought on um, the needs of survivors in, in trauma healing? And how that, um, as he might say, how it, how survivors, how do survivors t typically need this before getting the additional healing and process that common justice provides? So in our experience, um, very few survivors get any formal help before coming to us. Like we're often, that doesn't mean they don't get help in relationships. Some do, some don't. You know, some haven't spoken to anyone about it before us. Others are are held deeply in their loving relationships where they do process it. It varies. Um, but I think... Um, yeah, I think as survivors, we need so much, right? We need to do basic things like secure our immediate safety um, and our immediate needs and our physical health and all of those things. And and then we need to restore a sense of power. You know, like I often think if so much of trauma distills down to powerlessness, which means like the opposite of trauma isn't just help, the opposite of trauma is power. And so we help our survivors in a ton of ways. You know, we provide intensive case management and all of those things. But I think one of the beauties of restorative justice is the way um, it provides for an opportunity for that inversion of powerlessness. Um, and as a survivor myself, um, you know, I've not, I've never seen anything that compares uh, to what that can do. And so um, in that respect, it feels like a really beautiful thing to keep fighting for. Danielle, thank you so much for taking time with us today. It's been extraordinary to hear from you directly and at long last, truly. Um, Restorative Justice on the Rise is honored and honored to be with each of you here today. I know so many here are working very directly in this field and have devoted their lives to it, really. So thank each of you for being here with us and for those who are listening in after the fact on the podcast which has been in motion for 13 years now. Thanks for spreading the word about restorative justice on the rise. And of course, common justice and the book until we reckon. And we look forward to hearing updates about the successes and that we're winning this together. Thank you, Danielle. And do you have any closing thoughts Thank for you. those of us? Uh, I think we're- um, Just enormous, enormous gratitude to you and to everyone who's here and listening today, like this is just, um, you know, we've got nothing but each other. And so feel very grateful um, to be in it with all of you. Mm. Until next time, I'm looking forward to hearing updates from you, Danielle, and probably will invite you back for another hour in the near future. Um, please consider that. And what an honor it's been for me as your host. We'll see you next time on Restorative Justice on the Rise and definitely get that book if you have not got it in front of you already um, until we reckon. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you. Thank you.